Okay. Okay, I think we're good. So, gentlemen out there, I'll wait for them to come in. Or, or not. Okay, let's see how that works. So, everyone, thanks so much for coming out tonight. Oh, are you coming or not, man? Like, make up your mind. I'm just messing. Um, thanks so much for coming out tonight, everyone. I know uh, it's a nice day out there, and I appreciate your time, so I don't want to waste any of it. So, let's get started with the trends in software engineering. Here's a little bit about me. So I started my own company called Vidya a few years ago because I wanted to do what I love, which is uh, writing code, building software, learning to do things the right way. And so I've built a lot of interesting systems for a lot of government and commercial clients, worked with a lot of technologies I loved, and some I didn't. Uh, so I've seen a lot along the way. Do a lot of writing and, and talking, and I teach courses in Java and Spark and Scrum. I'm a passionate advocate for diversity in software engineering, um, including all you know, genders, races, sexual orientations, whatever, um, the disabled, people from different academic backgrounds. I think everyone has something to offer, and I like to invite everyone to, to be involved. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, basically it about me. Uh, as we proceed during the course of the evening, feel free to interrupt, um, slow me down if I'm going too fast or if I'm saying something doesn't make sense. Uh, hopefully this will be more of a conversation than, than me rambling. Uh, it's much more fun for everyone that way. So with that, let's talk about our first trend. So in October 2016, for the first time ever, mobile traffic exceeded desktop traffic. And uh, there was also around the same time a bunch of studies that showed that uh, mobile customers are by far the most loyal. They're two and a half times more likely to converse than desktop customers, and by convert, I mean do whatever it is you want them to do, uh, whether it's uh, buy your product or, or subscribe to whatever you're offering or fill out that loan application. Whatever it is you want them to do, they're two and a half times more likely to do on mobile. So the trend is basically that you need to have a mobile first strategy from the start, even if that means at the expense of the desktop. And so the obvious way to do that is to build native apps. And uh, there are some native-only apps out there, like Snapchat. Uh, there were two presidential candidates in America in 2016 who had native apps. Anyone know who they were? One Democrat, one Republican. Bernie Sanders, please come if you want. Bernie Sanders and Ted Cruz, yeah. So they were the two. Uh, so they had those alongside their, their traditional campaign websites. And it's become a lot easier to build native apps because the tech has gotten very innovative. Uh, on the iOS side, you have the emergence of Swift from Apple, which is slowly phasing out its objective C, a much more cumbersome language. Uh, Swift is really nice to work with, very powerful. And on the Android side, you have the emergence of Kotlin, written by JetBrains. Anyone know who they are? Who are they? Yes, they're the authors of the preeminent Java IDE called IntelliJ IDEA, among other IDEs as well. And uh, last year at Google One, they made, uh, Google made and, uh, Kotlin a first-class Android language. And from that point on, Android has really just shot through the roof. And now there's, or excuse me, Kotlin has shot through the roof. And they're saying now that by the end of 2018, that it is quite possible that there will be more Kotlin Android apps than Java Android apps, which is actually uh, quite remarkable. Now, no one's phasing out Java, uh, but I have to say that it is definitely, Kotlin is a much more pleasant experience to work with, much less cumbersome, much more lightweight than Java is for building Android apps. There's also, uh, if you don't like either of those, there's React Native, which is from Facebook, which lets you build native apps with native components using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, the web technologies we all love. Uh, there's also Xamarin, if you like the .NET ecosystem. But I would like to point out, though, that uh, there's something I think that's cooler than all of those, and that's the progressive web application concept, which is something that came out of Google uh, for a few years now. 
And basically, PWAs are just like conventional web apps, except that they're endowed with service workers, which are lightweight JavaScript uh, code in the background that basically acts as a proxy server and helps endow your web application with native-like capabilities. So push notifications, caching for offline content, uh, home screen icons, all the things you kind of expect, bless you, all the things you kind of expect from a native app you can get from a PWA. And uh, they're really starting to take off. Uh, the Twitter mobile site is a PWA. Uh, the Washington Post website is a PWA. My own company website is a PWA. A Wired is now a PWA. When Alibaba went PWA, their conversions went up, I think, 76%, something like that. So uh, they're kind of a big deal. Uh, uh, Microsoft is actually, well, along with Google, Microsoft has actually gone all in on this, which is surprising, uh, at least to me. And uh, Facebook, actually, with Create React App, which is a, if you, uh, anyone develops here in, in React, anyone? So, okay, so you know then that it, uh, Create React App is basically like part of the React CLI that helps you, like when you're starting from scratch for a React app, you just you use a CLI to do Create React App, and it generates your PWA by default. The Vue.js CLI can do similar things. So it's definitely catching on. It's definitely um, a big deal, except Safari is a little bit slow to jump on because the App Store makes Apple a lot of money. Um, but hopefully they'll come along eventually. And I will also say from experience that the tooling on building PWAs could be better, needs to be improved. Uh, but having said all that, I really do believe PWAs are the future of the mobile web, maybe, maybe later than sooner, but eventually, because uh, I find it very hard to bet against the web. Our next trend, security and privacy. Now, you might think this is a no-brainer in the sense that I don't have to tell any of you that these two things are important. But I don't mean it quite in that way when I mention these. Uh, we just had two days of Mark Zuckerberg getting grilled in front of Congress uh, for like, like a total of 10 hours uh, since uh, they had some issues for several years betraying our trust and most recently with Cambridge Analytica and compromising 90 million users. Uh, but there are other stories too, right? I mean, there's Equifax who took all our data without kind of asking. And uh, because they didn't upgrade their web software, their Apache struts to the latest version, uh, they were compromised, um, and then which compromised half this country. And then um, they took about six months to report that and make that public. Uh, the Amazon Echo can call other Echoes, but it can't block other Echoes from calling you, which can be a new for some people. Congress made it easier for ISPs um, to share your information without your consent. Uh, we've seen hacks of Disney and Sony and HBO. Uh, we've seen um, election tampering in many countries, including our own. I mention all this not to make you feel depressed, but to point out that these are stories we all know. They're not buried in Wired magazine. They're in Trevor Noah's monologue. They're in Stephen Colbert's monologue. Everyone knows this stuff. And the trend that I want to point out it's not that we should care about security and privacy, which of course we should, but that regular people are far more attuned to their security and their privacy than they've ever been. Uh, they know, for example, that when they get online to their bank, it should say HTTPS in the browser. They don't know why or what that means, <laughs> but they know that it should happen, right? So my point is that just as we need a mobile first strategy, we need a security and privacy first strategy from the beginning because we don't have the leeway Facebook has. Facebook will probably emerge from this no problem because people have made a huge investment in Facebook and they probably don't see the, the big deal of all this if Cambridge Analytica had their stuff. But I don't know if the rest of us have that kind of leeway. So if we compromise people's security and their trust and their privacy, we'll probably not get them back. So how do we then take advantage of what's available to us to secure and, and uh, privatize people's data? Well. First, we have a lot of security features in modern frameworks right now. Uh, anyone work with Spring Boot, for example? Right. So uh, Spring Boot, for example, if you just uh, put the Spring security jars in your class path, you have basic authentication like that. That's a little thing. And now, obviously, that's not the full solution for what you want security-wise. But the idea that by putting a file somewhere, <laughs> you now have some measure of security, that's kind of cool. Uh, Rails. 
uh, Play Framework, which is a web framework that I've worked a lot with that's, uh, for Java and Scala. Um, they have built-in controls against placement. Please enjoy the pizza. Uh, they have built-in controls to deal with uh, CS uh, cross-site uh, request forgery attacks, cross-site script scripting attacks. There are all the persistence frameworks now have controls against uh, SQL injection. You have all this stuff available to you. Avail yourself of it. Make sure it's, it's part of your development effort. Also, we have hopefully now continuous integration and build pipelines for CI uh, for, uh, continuous integration continuous delivery. And we have functional tests that are, and unit tests that are part of these for hi for uh, functional testing. But why don't we add security tests to the same build pipeline using tools like BDD Security, OWASP, Zap, which are both open source. There are a lot of um, commercial ones too. Make those part of your continuous build as well. Um, and you don't always have to be strictly security testing to be security testing. So for example, if you're, if you're uh, performance testing, with something like Gatling, which is a Scala um, performance testing tool. Well, if you are testing your ability to handle a lot of load, the fact that load comes from legitimate use or from a DDoS attack shouldn't matter, right? So you're kind of, in a way, doing an end around and, and sort of security testing by testing your performance under load. Uh, similarly with static analysis. Uh, looking for red flags in your code that could potentially be vulnerabilities down the road. Uh, Let's Encrypt is a free and open source certificate authority. Uh, so, oh, I, you know, I forgot to mention in the last slide that PWAs uh, can only be deployed to HTTPS, which makes a lot of sense because essentially service workers are men in the middle, right? Uh, now, there are men in the middle who are doing their work for good instead of evil. But if, if a bad person gets a hold of those service workers, now they are working for evil. So you have to be deployed to HTTPS. And it used to be a pain to get certificates. And people usually didn't really do it um, until later and it's necessary. But Let's Encrypt makes it easy because you can just grab a certificate from there and upload it to your host and do whatever you need to do, all free. A lot of hosts also will have seamless integration with Let's Encrypt. So maybe you don't have to do anything, just hit a button and now all of a sudden you have HTTPS. So there should be no excuse anymore for not developing securely with HTTPS. JSON web tokens, anyone heard of those? Go ahead, what do you know about them? That's good. So yeah, so basically they're a lightweight alternative to SAML, which you may have heard of. Yes. Sir. Yes. Uh huh. Checks the certificate. Yeah. Well, they're a. Go ahead. You're gonna say something. Oh. I mean, yeah. So there's two parts to that. When you're ensuring the secure nature of the messages, then the other one is very secure in the person on the other end. But I mean, that's what certificate authority does, though. Any, I mean, whether it's like the old school ones, like uh, who are the old school ones? Um, Ferrisign, that's the one. Yeah. Well, that's because the browsers trust them, right? So, like, they trust Let's Encrypt as well, because, like, you know, they know that Let's Encrypt isn't run by, you know. Wiley Coyote. So it, it's uh, it's one of those things where like it's a pretty big consortium and, and people are pretty cool with it. So um, yes, sir. So I did see an interview with somebody though saying the number of variations on closed to PayPal that had specifically somebody within hours of the service coming available. Yeah, you're right. You know, it's a good question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It absolutely is. Is there in the back? So, um, yeah, so I don't know if they have a relationship with Let's Encrypt, but I do know that um, there are a lot of, like Cloudflare and others like them, 
will have capabilities for you to like deploy certificates. They might have their own way of doing it with their own partners or themselves managing the certificates, but it's a similar concept, if not technically working with Let's Encrypt per se. So yeah, I'm not suggesting that you have to only use Let's Encrypt. I mean, if a host you're working with has the ability to give you certificates, then, then take that. Um, I'm just saying though that uh, for those who don't have that option, you have a free thing right there available for you. You don't have to pay anymore like you used to for, with VeriSign and, and others back in the day. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's free open source. Yeah. It's, you had a question, sir? Um, I don't know if it, I would work with, uh, to me they feel duplicative, I wouldn't have both, but you'd have to decide if, if you think JSON web tokens are enough for you. Like For me, the way I've seen them use is where uh, you basically, you have this little string that's attached to your HTTP payload, and typically it's with a REST request, whereas IC sample used typically with uh, SOAP requests, but that's not necessarily true either. It doesn't have to be that way. Regardless, um, so you have this like header and payload and signature that you've encrypted with your secret, um, and the signature is like a digest of the header and the, and the payload. So what it amounts to is that you have authentication, because uh, it's your secret, and, and hope, and presumably no one else has your secret. And also, you've uh, guarded against tampering, because otherwise you would have um, the signatures won't match. But it doesn't do anything to hide the nature of the payload. You have to do something else to encrypt what's actually in the payload, whether you do it over HTTPS or however you choose to do it. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it doesn't really uh, obfuscate the data itself at all. It's just basically like um, like a signature that says, here's this open thing, but it, I, I promise you it's mine. Any other questions? Okay. So, uh, so that's JSON Web Tokens. Uh, transparency and control for users. Now, with Facebook, you got, Mark Zuckerberg got uh, grilled with this uh, quite a bit. Um, the key thing, I would say, is that you need to give your users full ownership, full control, and um, the ability to expire that control over what they decide to share with you. And to make it for real, because technically, I guess Facebook could have said that, hey, we were doing that. <laughs> um, but they, they kind of weren't. Um, Twitter. Uh, they, they've gotten better. I know you're <laughs> I was about to say, Google Cloud, yeah. Yeah. So we're doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Twitter, Twitter though it has like like uh, several months ago they sort of redid their privacy. Um, whether it's enough is a debatable question, but at least they recognized. I feel like Apple does pretty well with this too. Um, so basically, the idea is that if you can give some kind of dashboard with very clear and you know no obfuscated terms of service, because I know no one reads terms of service and it's not Zuckerberg's fault that that's true, but when you make it read like like, you know, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky got together and they were drunk. Like, it's just a very, like, difficult thing for people. So to make it easy uh, and clear and to have an expiration date and to be granular, that, okay, you know, I'm willing to share all the movies I, I saw, but I don't want to show this other thing. You know, just giving people that, um, that ability to control it and to mean it, which Facebook didn't, uh, that's very, very important to do. And finally, uh, privacy engineering is a discipline. It's a real thing you can go to school for now. It's a thing that you will see Uber and other companies look out for and put uh, job requisitions out for. It's basically a combination of uh, law, tech, and policy. And uh, NIST recently put out guidelines for privacy engineering, so it's in government as well. And whether you invest in these skills for yourself or you find other actual privacy engineers, and it's a very important thing to get to know. And it's also difficult, right? I mean, these are three not easy areas, <laughs> policy, law, and tech. But people who are skilled at, at all three, who are true privacy engineers, will be an asset to organizations going forward. Okay, so for decades now, 
And there has been a debate among developers about whether, please come in, sir, and help yourself to whatever you like. Please don't. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so there's been a debate among developers over which, uh, which is more productive and pleasant for developers to work with, a statically typed language or a dynamically typed language. And by that I mean types checked at compile time versus types checked at runtime, which is easier, which is more productive. And however you feel, and you know, the debate rages, it's on Stack Overflow, on Reddit, at all the hottest parties, people debate these things. And, and so like, whatever you feel about it, the consensus is kind of formed that statically typed languages are more productive. And the reason makes a lot of sense to me, because uh, it is really nice to get a quick feedback loop from my compiler or from my IDE when I've messed something up. Uh, when I'm integrating with other systems, which is a pain, and I've done a lot of it, uh, knowing that I've screwed up my types right away, again, is very, very helpful. Uh, when I'm refactoring and I'm cleaning up my technical debt in my project, because I'm agile, right, uh, making sure I didn't break anything in, with the types at compile time, that's very, very helpful. And so that consensus is exemplified by these languages I show you here. So Go, you've all heard of, it's from Google. Um, a small, some would say underwhelming language because it doesn't do everything like Java tries to. But the things it does do, it does very well. People really like it. It had a huge surge in popularity out of the jump. It's kind of plateaued since, but people still love it for high concurrent throughput systems. I'll talk more about that later. Scala is a language I work with quite a bit now. It's a language for the JVM that combines the, the object-oriented nature of Java with the functional nature of, say, Haskell or Lisp. And it got pretty popular around, even though it's, Scala's been around since like 2006 or so, but it got really popular around like 2010 or 11, around the same time that, that the Git was becoming popular and Apache Spark was becoming popular. Because Spark is built in Scala, it's most productive APIs in Scala, so as that kind of took off, Scala sort of took off too. And now you have web frameworks and Scala.js and a bunch of other things with Scala. Uh, Swift and Kotlin we've talked about, uh, but they're, they also go beyond the mobile space. Uh, Swift is uh, now involved in server-side development. Kotlin has web apps, or, and um, there's actually a blockchain implementation called Corda, written in Kotlin. Uh, there's data science stuff in Kotlin, so uh, plenty of things there. Uh, people, uh, there's Kotlin native as well, and Scala native, by the way for uh, not running on the JVM by Colin and Scala do. Uh, Rust, anyone heard of Rust? What do you know about it? Mm -hmm. You're stealing my thunder for a later slide, but that's cool. Right. So Rust is a language from the Mozilla Foundation, and it's a systems language. And it's used now kind of the way people would use C++ and C back in the day. Uh, <clears throat> so when you want to get on bare metal, you don't want a virtual machine, or stupid runtime in your way, you want to control your memory, you want to control everything, you want all that power in your fingertips. And you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So if you would use Rust now. The thing is, people, well, it's funny because I, I call Rust the Grateful Dead of programming languages in that it has not that many people who love it but the or who use it, but the people who use it absolutely adore it. It's typically among the most loved languages on any survey. And the reason why is because you're doing these complicated things, right? You're managing your memory, you're handling threads, you all that stuff that the, uh, typically a VM would do for you, a Java virtual machine or whatever would do for you. Please come in. Take your time. Find a good spot. Um, so, hold on one sec. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, so Rust actually prevents a lot of bugs from happening because it's really good at helping you, <clears throat> excuse me, manage your memory and do all those things. I remember when I wrote C++ back in the day when I was a young man, and like, the things would just blow up. Like, I would write my code for, you know, the project was due in like two hours, and I'd be writing my code, and I'd try to compile, the lights would flicker, and then the the thing would just blow up and no errors, no exceptions, nothing, because <laughs> I screwed something up with my memory. Rust stops that, right? Rust actually helps you avoid any of that. 
that problem. And people, like I said, who use Rust absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. So Gust, oh, God, Gust, Go, maybe that's a new language I just came up with. I'm so innovative. Yeah. So Go uh, runs in a runtime. Okay. Um, it, I'm trying to remember now. You don't have full access to everything like you do in Rust. I do know that. Um, I'm trying to remember the actual distribution aspect of it. But basically, like, so here's the thing. Like, I find Rust to be complicated, but. Um, right now, it's kind of, like, I don't know. Yeah. Hiring a lot of people when they find them. Does that make your program up? I, I do not. So, so, I'll be so I, I'm about. I'm going to actually talk about a, a something that uses Rust later on that you actually hinted at. But um, but as far as like like examples of people using Rust, I, I, I've only seen it at the Mozilla Foundation itself. And they were talking about the fact that it does have It's written for doing. Yeah. So I think that's part of Yeah, for sure. So if you want to do systems programming nowadays with a lot more protection, Rust is the way you want to go. Uh, and finally, I mentioned JavaScript. Now you might be wondering, like, that's kind of the preeminent dynamic language. Like, why is it on this slide at all? Uh, and in fact, it's also true that when people who are novices ask me, like, how am I going to get into programming? What should I look at? I always say either JavaScript or Python, which are both not statically type languages. But having said that, the JavaScript ecosystem, though, still has kind of had a consensus on static typing. Because if you look at TypeScript from Microsoft, you look at Flow from Facebook, look at Solid.js and Kotlin.js on Elm, which is another pretty cool language out there, um, all of these are statically typed. Now it just so happens it can be transpiled into dynamically typed JavaScript in the end. But uh, the fact that the whole community still has static typing and believes in it, that's still, I think, something important to note. And even when you work with Python, there are libraries you can import that help you do static typing, even though the language technically isn't statically typed. So I would say that the idea that dynamic typing is great for bigger complex systems. It might be great for learning, which is why I recommend it to people who are new. But I feel like static typing is the way to go in general for the starting to build real things, even in the JavaScript world. OK, functional programming. This can be kind of a scary slide sometimes. Whenever I mention it, uh, people get a little nervous. So I'm not suggesting that if you don't go out and learn Haskell tomorrow, you're not going to be employed in a year. I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm not talking about literally functional programming languages per se, though learning them isn't going to hurt. More importantly, it's that the concepts, the principles behind functional programming, the things that make it powerful, the things that make it cool, those are the things that are underlying a lot of other trends in software engineering that we'll talk about soon. So what are these principles? Well, for one, there's first class composable functions. So in an object-oriented language, how does that work? Well, you write all these objects that maintain state. They all uh, talk to each other by, by mutating in each other's state. And then eventually, at the end, you have some object that represents some result. That's fine. But we have a more flexible way of handling all that stuff with functional programming of first class composable functions, where instead of objects, we deal in behavior. And these behaviors are handed around the project as parameters, as return types, and so on. And this allows us to build basically data flows where we have one function whose outputs become the inputs to another function, whose outputs become the inputs to the next function. And we start to build these flows, these composable flows. And we can start with one thing, and at the end, we have this other thing. And we can take that set of Legos and deconstruct it and use those functions in different ways and create alternate flows. One sec. And so the fact that we can do that, that gives us a lot of flexibility and power. Okay? What, who did? 
I'm sorry, I'm not familiar. I, I'm not, but that sounds pretty neat. And it's like certainly the idea of like real flexible code we use and um, like. No. <laughs> We're awesome. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I've heard of it, yeah. This is lower level than that, I would say. Yeah, this is that, what you're talking about is more of an abstraction. I mean, this, the idea certainly is still appropriate. Uh, the idea of building something that can be reused and composed with others of its kind, but uh, yeah, for sure. Um, immutability, the idea that once we create something, we don't update it. Now, that might seem like a weird thing to a lot of people who are used to setters in Java, who are used to um, an update and delete statement in SQL, but it turns out that immutability is a really powerful thing that makes our code much easier to, uh, to reason about and to understand and debug. And to help you understand this, let me give an analogy. So we are all used to working with relational databases. And relational databases are immutable. And they're being hit from all sides by different threads of different users and whatever. So we, are, we take great pains to protect our data from all this. We spend a lot of time dealing with uh, optimistic pessimistic locking or you know, managing our transactions so that if we have all these operations going on, we have to all succeed or, no, or none succeed. And if somewhere down the road one of them stops working, well, now we've got to roll back the ones that did work. That's a lot of effort and complexity that we've also have taken for granted as the cost of doing business. <laughs> but uh, that's the price of mutability. Where like when you have everything hitting this one thing that can be changed at any time, it's it, it makes for complicated life. So when you're debugging an immutable program, it is so much easier because you can look at something and say, okay, once it's created, I know that's how it's going to be throughout the rest of the program. It makes things a lot easier going forward. Pure functions. Anyone know what that means? Go ahead. What's a pure function? Okay, so pure functions mean that you have no side effects outside of the. What's a side effect? A side effect would be changing something besides the return type of your method in your program. Let's okay. That may be. That's kind of a great definition. But you, the only change you should be doing is your return type. You do not operate on the arguments that come into your method. Um, no side effects we were talking about. Uh, benefits are they're often protecting because, well, well, the other thing is to your point too, is I shouldn't return it because it was a direct input. I should make a copy of any <coughs> Which is immutable, yeah. That it's immutable. Yeah. yeah. So the benefits are testing, also good for multi threading, because you don't have to worry that you're impacting other parts of the program. What was that? Yeah. Yeah. So, to, I mean, there was a lot there, and I, I, would, I would definitely agree with all of it. Um, for me, I, I think a little bit more simply than that, in the sense of pure functions are simply uh, functions that operate on only the things that they control. Whereas an example of an impure function, a function with a side effect, which is uh, where you inter integrate with something that you don't control is like writing to a database. There's a network, there's a database, there's all these things I don't control. Now, I have to do that eventually, right? I have to write a result some, somewhere at some point. Uh, but but the, uh, the idea of a pure function is that I only for every one input, I always get the exact same output. That's the key, the determinism part of it. Because imagine, okay, let's say we're talking about a side effect function that writes to a database, okay? And I have a, an input, and I, I insert it in, and it works. That's scenario one, okay? Some sort of response telling me that it's success. But okay, let's say now the network is down. Same exact input, try to store it, exception, blows up, Okay, that's scenario two. Same input, database is up, network is up, but someone forgot to actually drop the schema, 
so the table doesn't exist. Okay, now it tries to insert and blows up a different kind of blow up though than the second one, but still a blow up. Now I've just given you one input that had three different outputs. When you're doing complicated work, that becomes a real pain to deal with. So you want to have functions as many as possible where the inputs are deterministic to the outputs. The same input always produces the same output and there are no side effects of reintegrating with anything that you don't control. And when you do those three things, you start to set the foundation for concurrency and parallelism and big systems and dividing up work amongst uh, different threads because you can build all kinds of data flows, as we mentioned with composable functions, similar to what you mentioned with the low code. Uh, I'm not worried about what could happen in terms of changing anything because I can figure and reason about what's going on because everything is immutable. And because all the functions are pure, everything is deterministic. And so I can see that for the same input, I'm always going to get the same output. Everything can, can be divided among all the cores and all the machines in the cluster. And at the end, finally, I'll have my side effects and I'll write to a database, I'll write to a file or whatever. But that's deferred. And so I can now, once I have these three principles at the top, I can now build big systems that do hard work with a lot of data and reason about it pretty well. So now, given this understanding of functional programming and why it's powerful, it now sets the stage for other things that have become like a big deal, okay? So like a while ago, when big data first started to become a thing, like, I don't know, 2010, 2011, something like that, right? Um, functional programming, that's when it kind of made its emergence because you probably know this, that functional programming was kind of big in the 70s, right? It was a big... Then. And then it kind of fell by the wayside with OO, and it had this resurgence, this renaissance because of big data. And why is that? Because big data is a natural fit. What do you do in a typical big data situation? At a high level, you load a bunch of data from some source into some collection. You then run that collection through a pipeline of functions that uh, filter, that transform, that aggregate. And then at the very end, write it out to HBase, write it out to HDFS, whatever, as your side effects. And so there's a natural fit between functional programming and data processing. Now, the thing, though, is that back in the day, people were kind of intimidated, developers were kind of intimidated by this work because they felt like, well, I'm not a math person. Uh, I, I don't know anything about R or MATLAB. Uh, I don't have the kind of data that are that complicated or that big that you need this kind of thing. How do I even set up a Hadoop cluster? Okay, uh, there's a lot of intimidation there. The trend I'm going to get at here is that big data has become democratized recently in the sense that uh, everyone now realizes that no matter how, you could be Amazon or you could be some mom and pop pizza shop on the corner, everyone needs to understand their business and their business domain. And everyone needs to know how to run some basic tooling. And the tooling is there in a lot of languages. Now, it's not just um, MATLAB and R and, and Python even, but like you have Kotlin and JavaScript and Java and Scala that pretty much any language you want is offering tooling. And even better, a lot of these languages offer, or tools, they offer model building capabilities. They have a lot of sensible defaults, which means you don't have to be, you know, Sheldon. To, uh, to be able to run these different models. So like, so basically, you know, the fact that uh, you, can, you can sort of build things that are pretty good. They might not be ready for like a PhD thesis, but things that are pretty good right out of the box that'll solve most people's problems right away, that's a pretty cool thing. And that kind of democratization is something that I hope uh, I can get, get across to you as kind of a trend that's happening. You don't have to be this super fancy person, <laughs> either in terms of the data you have or the technology you have uh, to do real useful analytics. Now, along those lines, let's talk about deep learning, which is sort of the next evolution of machine learning. And I'll let you read, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll let you read this quote from the CEO of NVIDIA. But the bottom line is, Deep learning provides a lot of really rich insights um, 
that you wouldn't get from typical machine learning. And the way it does that is by iterating in layers over the data set. And so a really a trivial example would be, let's say you're trying to classify images of animals and you have your model and the model will iterate over the, the, the different uh, training data set and it'll say, okay, I, I realize that there are some patterns of light and dark in these photos. Okay, that's the, the output of the first run. But then that becomes the input to the next run because we have composable functions here going on again. And it runs over the data again and now it figures out, oh, okay, those patterns of light and darkness, they show me now some ear patterns. And so those ear patterns now become the inputs of the next layer. And eventually I can sort of figure out this is a cat, this is a dog, and that's a rabbit, and that's a wolf. So as you build these, uh, these models, it, it turns out that there are a lot of tools out there that are, again, democratizing how we can deep learn. Because we have TensorFlow, which is kind of the famous one from um, Google, and it's, uh, it's a pretty cool tool and pretty easy to use. There's also Teano, T-H-E-A-N-O, for those who are uh, scoring at home. Like, these two are pretty powerful and pretty popular, and they're both Python-based. Uh, there's an abstraction called Keras, K-E-R-A-S, that can wrap around either of them and provides an even nicer abstraction. So again, I mentioned how you get a lot of nice defaults in a lot of tools nowadays. Well, Keras can help provide that, even if TensorFlow doesn't. Um, there's also, and I think this is super cool, there's a TensorFlow.js now. So what that means is you can do deep learning in your browser, which means you can do deep learning on your phone. That's the hotness, you know, like that's pretty cool. So there are other tools as well that are, are really powerful in this space. Uh, MXNet from Amazon, the Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, which uh, works with obviously the .NET languages, but also with uh, Java and Python and Keras. Um, there's uh, the, uh, the Apache Spark Tensor Frames um, API that lets you do a lot of stuff there. So there are, again, tools for whatever you need. And even your hardware needs to be uh, on point. So that's, that's why NVIDIA is so happy. Because you need, typically you need GPUs, really powerful processing for, for these kinds of intensive efforts. But uh, Cisco, AMD, and others are starting to work on better CPUs to help with this as well. But the tools are there for you right now to get started. And I really think you should look at, at the very least, TensorFlow.js. That's pretty hot. OK, so this might be my most complicated slide. So like, uh, bear with me, and feel free to ask me to clarify. So in the world of big data, people are often focused on size, on the volume of terabytes, and I need my cluster of 20 machines but what about the speed of data, data in motion, the fact that it's all coming at you from your phone and your tablet and your Fitbit and your Tesla, okay, your watch. Like there's data coming at you from all sides. I and mean, you have to be able to handle not just volume, but uh, speed. And the industry has sort of come to a consensus on using streams as the abstraction for dealing with lots of data coming at you from all directions. And they manifest in several different ways, and I mentioned three of them here, um, and they're all totally different, or at least certainly the first one, the second one, and the third one um, are, let's just say that it's not always clear how streaming is, is happening, but like all three of them have come to a consensus on streaming as a abstraction for large data coming at you at once. Has anyone heard of reactive programming? What, what is it? Yeah. That's just an example. Yep. Yeah. So, were you going to start reactive? Oh, were you? Okay. I thought it was fine. So reactive programming is basically this idea, and you know, entire books have been written, so I'm not going to do it justice in like this one word. But reactive programming is basically this idea that we need to write software that's um, extra resilient and responsive because we're going to take advantage of every core in our machine and be fault tolerant because we handle our errors really, really well. And we divide the work amongst all, all our resources, which means, of course, Parallelizing, which means, of course, immutability and the functional ideas we just talked about, 
So you often hear functional React programming, even though they're not equivalent, they often go really well together. And so uh, a lot of programming languages now and frameworks are investing in this idea of reactive programming. For example, Java 9 now has a reactive screens API. Uh, the Go programming language has the idea of Go routines and channels. So channels are basically uh, ways for Go routines, which are light, lightweight threads that can divide up the work to communicate with each other so that they can keep their limbs organized as they work in parallel to solve a big, complicated problem. Um, there's also something called Aka Streams in the Scala world, which is a really awesome concurrency framework as well. Um, you mentioned RxS. It turns out there's actually a whole reactive uh, set of libraries out there for pretty much any programming language you want. And one of them, RxJS, will let you, for example, write JavaScript code that can uh, turn all your events into streams, what you call observables, what they call observables. They're really streams, and the observers, which are basically just functions, who sit there and, like we see in Apple, process what comes down the stream, they basically like filter out. Like, I, for example, I could say, you know, uh, I'm going to filter out all my mouse down events, but I want to keep all my uh, click events and process them. Or I'm going to join all my click events with all of my mouse over events. Whatever, like all, whatever kinds of aggregations and filtering and mapping I'm going to do with my streams, I can do through functional programming capabilities. The CAP architecture is something totally different. CAP architecture was something that uh, came, was devised by uh, Jay Kreps, formerly of LinkedIn, and now uh, Hex Confluent, which is the company behind a technology called Apache Kafka, which you may have heard of. And basically, his thinking was, what if you built your entire architecture on the idea that um, everything is a stream, that Everything people want to do is stored on some uh, immutable, append-only, fault-tolerant, distributed system. And people just process what they want out of it. And they ignore what they want through filter, to use a functional programming term. And they process what they want to use. And that's it. And everything in your system, in your architecture, should be part of a stream in one sec. And so Kafka would be one example of exactly that. Uh, Amazon Kinesis on AWS is another, and just it's a cool thing because it lets you again aggregate all your your data into the stream and maybe parcel it out into littler streams, and then have functional programming pipelines in place to then take what comes down the pipe and just run it through and you know store it at the end. We're gonna do analytics, whatever you want to do with it, and and then you can move forward to your business. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, well, I feel like um, a lot of the modern programming languages, um, they do a couple of things really well. One is that they make it harder for you to write bugs. And to me, the, the mark of a good programming language is that it makes it hard for you to write a bug. And that's why a lot of people like Rust, for example, because that's kind of the most ambitious thing you're trying to do and in terms of managing everything yourself, and yet it provides all these safeguards to prevent you from hurting yourself. The other thing that a lot of model languages do really well is that they help you maximize the strength of your machine and letting you divide up the work among cores with various abstractions. You know, I mentioned Go has the Go routines. Uh, Scala has something called a future. Java has a completable future. Just these abstractions that are available to you to, um, to let you take advantage of the power of your machine. I was actually reading because I, I've been saving up to maybe get the iMac Pro. And uh, I'm looking at, okay, oh, 10 cores, that's so cool. And but the thing, though, is I need software that knows how to leverage 10 cores, right? And I need algorithms 
that you parallelized. And I need, you know, immutable data and all the other things that let me parallelize things. And so uh, it, it all ties together, like you said. But a language that makes it easy for me to write highly parallel concurrent code is a language I want to work with. I don't know if that answers your question or makes your point. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was doing some Rails stuff like years ago. And one of the things I felt like sort of turned me off from Rails is that, it, or Ruby really, was that Ruby wasn't really embracing like illustrated programming and like, and it kind of was in some like GitHub projects or whatever, but I didn't feel like the language really embraced it like at its core. Scala, Go, a lot of these other languages really do like treat streams and parallel processing as first class citizens. And that's what I like, personally. So with the capital architecture, now keeping in mind that we have a stream-based architecture, now consider these two architectural patterns, event sourcing and CQRS. Event sourcing is basically uh, an architectural pattern where everything that happens to your enterprise is an event. It's time-stamped and it's recorded on some immutable, append-only, resilient, distributed data store like Kafka or Kinesis. And, and again, like Lucy and Ethel, you have functions that just read these events as they come along and, and process them however you wish. And it's really great. It's more complicated maybe than we're used to. But if you have a lot of updates coming to you at, at once, if you have the need for an audit trail for regulatory purposes or whatever, it's really helpful. And it also ties really nicely to this pattern called CQRS, which stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. Ugh, rolls off the tongue. Just so sexy that the terminology. Command Query Responsibility Segregation. There's a fancy way of saying this, that um, right now you have uh, a database that represents kind of the, uh, the sum total of everything that's ever happened. It's the state of your system right now. You have no idea what, what came before, but the sum total of all your inserts and your updates and your deletes are now represented at this time T0 in your database. And because it's important and because you can't possibly recreate it, you take all these steps to protect it. Lots of backups, transaction management, um, locking optimistic or pessimistic, all those things. Well, imagine then if we could instead uh, maintain this write log, this is a source, and then just recreate the database whenever we need it. Okay, and CQRS takes that another step where by saying, well, our databases kind of have two different concerns going on, typically. Your read concern and your write concern, they're different. For example, I might say for my reads, okay, you know what, my reads got to be like, on point. They got to be three milliseconds or less. My writes, though, eh, 600, 700 milliseconds, I can live with that. Okay, that's a different performance concern. Um, security or authorization. Pretty much anybody can read, but my writes, like, very high authorization level. So now I have different security concerns. And yet, even though I have different concerns between read and write, I have one application. And I have one piece of code that talks to it, an active model. Uh, an active model class in Rails or a JPA POJO in Java. What if instead, since so we have two concerns that are so different, we had two different pieces of software, one for writes, one for reads, and different code that would interact with each. So our writes could simply be an event log, an event sourcing, where like every event that happens, timestamps, any insert, any update, any delete, whatever, gets recorded. Those are our rights only. But then, you know, boss wants um, every, uh, like, are the six totals for the last six months by state. Okay, boss wants, boss gets. So I now write a function over the event log that says, filter out everything except for the last six months, aggregate by state and sum, and create a little table. And it, by the way, it doesn't have to be in a fancy Oracle or Express or whatever. It can be in Redis, it's just a cache, a transient, data store that's quick read and I can just 
generated and created, done. Oh, boss, I want eight months? Fine, tear down that first one, and now I'll rewrite my function to say, filter out am I running late. And so, like, you know, filter out instead of six, do eight, and do that. Uh, oh, boss wants a brand new uh, thing to look at, a new view? Fine, I write a new function over the event log. There have been times in my life where I uh, built a relational database schema for an application, and it was, I'm so proud of it. Like, it was fast, it, all, it was indexed perfectly, every query people wanted to run that I knew they wanted to run was mm, Tesla speed. Oh, but then they start wanting new things. And then my figure out my data is not at all optimized for what, the new things that they want. And so uh, what, what I do, like redo the schema, or you know, that takes a long time, and refactor that. The bottom line is, with this set up, that's not even an issue. Because I have my raw source of truth as my event log in my event source. And if they want something new, I just write a brand new function in Spark Streaming or using one of the Kafka clients or using Goka, which is a Go client for Kafka. Like, I can do any of that. And, like, it's totally up to me because I have my raw source of truth at any moment. So that's another case where streams are very powerful. And so the point of this slide is simply that, that we have sort of come to a convergence as a community that in the, this era where we have not just big data but fast data coming at you, that streams manifest in different ways uh, have become sort of a way for us to handle it. And there are technologies out there, both on the streaming side, like Kafka and Kinesis, and on the client side, like Goka and Kafka Client from, from Confluent, Spark Streaming, and the rest to help us consume it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, functions as a service. Anyone ever heard of this? Ever heard of serverless architecture? That's the, the more common term, though I don't really care for it. So you've heard of it? Okay, cool. So let's back up and do a little history lesson here. So back in the day, we would have traditional applications, and we still do. There are these big monoliths that basically combine everything, right? Every, every single thing is coupled together and all wrapped up in one big bundle. And honestly, there is some simplicity to that. And if you're a small or even a mid-sized application, having to manage just one thing, even for all its little uh, warts, eh, it's the devil we know, we like it, you know, it's cool, and it's fine in a lot of cases. But then as we start to get really big, we start to figure out that, you know, this tight coupling, mm, maybe not so hot. So then we start to apply the single responsibility principle and say, okay, let's divide up our monolith into pieces that are independently deployable microservices, which are, have bounded context, which is the fancy phrase meaning that they're completely self-sufficient. They have their own database, they have their own cache, whatever they need to, to bless you, wherever they need to exist independently they have. They're deployed in, independently with their own DevOps um, continuous delivery setup. And so now you start to have, you've broken up your monolith into these little individual microservices because you've decided the pain of having a, a bunch of things is worth it given how the tight coupling was hurting us before. We've made that determination. In order to do this though, it does make life simpler when you have a bigger application, but we had to invest in knowledge of tools like Chef and Puppet and Ansible and Docker and all the Kubernetes, all the rest. And we had to be sort of knowledgeable about how many servers we want to spin up, right? We can't just like, we have to put some numbers or some values into those artifacts, those deployment artifacts. So we have to be more aware of things. Well, when you get to function as a service, we're deconstructing that even further. We're now, we're taking our microservices and breaking it up into individual functions that are stateless, event-driven, and do one thing and one thing well. And beyond that, there's the cool part, they're infinitely scalable, meaning I don't have to actually care about defining how many of them I want or, or you know, how many servers I need or anything like that. When the function is needed, when the event happens that it's responding to, it spins up in a few milliseconds, does its work, spits out the deterministic output because it's stateless and pure, and ramps back down. And as many of them or as few of them as needed. 
Uh, common examples of this are AWS Lambda, Google Cloud Functions, uh, Microsoft Azure Functions. Uh, and let me give you an example with AWS Lambda. So let's say I have a video company and I upload my video to S3. Okay, that's an event. It triggers a function that takes the video and runs it through Amazon's Elastic Transcoder to generate all the different mobile formats that the browsers like. Okay, does that and dumps the three or four new iterations of the video in a different S3 bucket. New event. That now triggers a function that defines the URLs of those new videos and stores them in Amazon RDS, the relational database. Oh, new event. Uh, send an email to me uh, telling me that everything worked and, uh, and that here are the URLs that were now published. So it's event driven and infinitely scalable. Now people are starting to look into um, how do these, how does this affect our DevOps pipeline at all? Like, do we need DevOps anymore? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, also, this is not an all or nothing proposition. How can I blend microservices with maybe a few functions of the service and maybe figure out like what's best suited to each purpose? Uh, there's also an open source, not ready for prime time, uh, thing called uh, Vision that runs on Kubernetes. Maybe one day when you're bored, you know, it's a rerun of This Is Us or something, that like you download it, play with it, see if you like the idea of functioning as a service, and if you do, maybe then invest in one of the real enterprise solutions from AWS or, no, what happened? AWS, Google Cloud, whatever, there we go. So yeah, that's functions as a service. So that's it. That, those are all the trends I really wanted to talk about today. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> and even better is hard to judge, right? It depends on the context, whether something's better. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> oh, here we go. Hey, mighty! You communicated over Corbin. We liked it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right, so <laughs> there's actually a good meetup that I go to, and there's like 20, whatever. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. But no, but okay, so I, I tried to keep these slides to be more at a high level and not about technologies, but about sort of concepts or principles, number one. Um, so I wasn't saying that, that Go, for example, in that other slide was like the, the trend as much as I was saying static programming languages, static type programming languages are the trend, and Go being an example. That's number one. Number two, it all depends on, on the kind of problem you're solving, as I mentioned earlier. And it depends on which languages uh, make it easy for you to avoid bugs. And so the languages that make it easy for you to avoid bugs are the ones that are going to succeed. I, I feel like it's that simple. Huh. I bet you the answer, I, I bet you the percentage would be high. I, the difference is that the question, the, the, uh, no, no, hey, here's the thing. I, I would, I, no, no, hold on, hold on. So I think the percentage would be high. It's, the problem would be that they might not be good at doing it. 
and that their tests are slow and they're maybe not truly unit tests. I see that a lot. I, I you know, this just this week um, in you know, Tales of Code Review, I um, was looking at people's unit tests and they were doing things like in Scala, you can do this thing called, you know, or actually Java too, a uh, local day dot now on their tests. And I just told them, you know what, when we get out of daylight savings time again, this test is going to fail. Because it's not truly a unit test. You're using the system clock. That's something you don't control, analogous almost to a pure function. Like you don't control it, so it's not really a unit test. So I would call that, but they, they tested. So there is unit testing, and then there's good unit testing. I would say most developers would say that they do unit test. I just don't know if they're always good at it. So I, I know you're not agreeing with me, because I, I feel like most developers have gotten the idea that they'll unit test just fine. Uh, and, and they like the, they've embraced the ideas of the old XP, extreme programming um, mantras. But like, but I think your broader question though is just in general, like which of these do you think have staying power? Yeah. Right. It, it all depends on what, like, so for example, progressive web apps, I think, are, I think they're going to overtake native apps eventually. Maybe not tomorrow. I'm not a sound all Casablanca. But, like, you know, eventually they will. Um, but as far as, like, the other, the, the languages slide, I think, is what you're focused on. Like, it depends on what, as I said, what problem you're solving and like what kinds of things people will want to do. If, if people are doing a lot of back-end concurrent system things, they're going to want to use Scala or Go. There's just no, I mean, if you're doing like a lot of uh, work like, uh, like at Comcast, for example, I know they're doing a lot of Go because they're doing a lot of processing of, uh, and high, um, high intensive processing of video and things like that. Uh, they're doing a lot of machine learning on not just like metadata of videos, but the videos themselves, and like uh, football games and sports games. Like they're actually having code that watches, in quotes, watches games and is gaining insights into how to model these things and how to recommend these things to people. That kind of stuff takes a lot of effort. You can't you just can't do that in like Rail or you know Ruby. So it, it just depends on the. Um, I feel the domain. There's no like one size fits all. I think. Yes. This might go up for big time, but a couple of thoughts. I, I was thinking about some of the things you're talking about, and I was thinking, and you, you brought this up. The the idea that we're now in a multi-core world yeah. on our phone and our pens and our screens and everything is multi-core now. Yeah. It's relatively new, right? Some of us might even do a batch processing uh, to put it in the end, but this. This is all really complicated. multi core stuff, multi processor stuff is so complicated, but I think we're going to, that's going to be something that we're going to see for the next 10, 20 years, and whatever the downstream implications of parallelism, yeah. which is hard to do well. And that's why I mentioned that, yeah. to your question, that the languages that give you those good abstractions, because it's really hard to write good parallel code, but if you have good abstractions like the Go routines and like features and Scala, um, then I think those should be com coming in really handy. Now, I don't want to, I'm perfectly cool taking questions, but I just want to get through this one slide because I will speak to these points as well. So, um, so on what to keep an eye on now going forward. I, these are things that, and this is all my opinion, by the way, so you're welcome to, to disagree. And maybe you would think, for example, blockchain should have been a trend in one of my slides. We'll, we'll talk about that. But these are all things that I think are important to keep an eye on and could maybe be in one of these slides next year but they're not quite where I want them to be to call them trending. Okay, so having said that, with apologies to Justin Timberlake, we are bringing SQL back, okay? And what I mean by that is that, you know, around that big data time period around 2010 or 11, when we started to like have this debate over, okay, how do we actually do data storage in a big data world? We can't do the relational uh, acid transaction thing. We can only do, you know, denormalize uh, document storage thing that Mongo and Cassandra and HBase were all doing and, and others. And so we have to abandon SQL, right? Because we need these proprietary languages like Vson and Mongo and all the rest. And so 
what has happened though since then is that we're starting to figure out that that actually a a lot of these big data technologies and databases can do more of the high consistency high availability all the acid ish kind of things that that we thought we couldn't do but also to use SQL as the abstraction to do it because everyone has always liked SQL and they get it. And so you see this with like, there's this thing called time scale DB, which is basically clustered Postgres. And uh, it's great for time series analysis. And because it's Postgres, it's SQL. And, and people do a lot of time series analysis on it. They really like it. Uh, it's open source with paid support. Uh, Amazon Athena basically lets you query your S3 buckets with SQL. Like, what? Yeah. So, I mean, that's the thing. Uh, Kafka lets you uh, manage your, uh, your streams using something called KSQL, which is, you know, lets you join streams and, and, you know, union them and all these other things that you can do in SQL. And, you know, Spark Streaming has done a bunch of SQL stuff going back a ways. So, just the, uh, keep in mind now that this big divide we used to have between relational SQL and proprietary language and big data database, not so anymore. GraphQL, this comes from Facebook. Uh, this is typically used with a lot of the Facebook ecosystem products, you know, React, React Native, Relay, Redux, but it is expanding beyond that slowly. And basically GraphQL kind of overcomes the limitations of REST. Now let's just, to give you an example, Let's say you were querying Facebook, because that's what the cool kids everyone, you know, do nowadays. So you're querying Facebook, and you want to know about the movies I like and the movies my friends like. Okay? Now let's say we're doing this via REST. And we all like REST. REST is easy to understand. It's based on standards. All that's great. But you do a query for, let's say I'm user number seven. Uh, Facebook.com slash user slash seven. You get my information. You get everything about me, really. Um, you get a bunch of crap you don't care about with me, as well as maybe the one thing you do, or two things you do, which is one, my the movies I liked, and two, the IDs of the friends. But you get a lot of other crap you don't want. But now you have, let's say I have a thousand friends. You have now a thousand URLs to go hit. So now you need to make a thousand REST calls, one for each user, to fetch their information. So that's intensive, right? A thousand HTTP calls. And then um, not only that, I'm getting back a bunch of data I don't want, and only a little bit that I do want. That's the problem GraphQL tries to solve. And so GraphQL is like, again, it's from Facebook, and it's basically this JSON-like syntax that lets you define precisely the data I want, you know, user, uh, movies, friends, movies, and like in the format that I want it in. And if you build out your stuff such that you're using a GraphQL client from like Apollo or GraphQL, and you've built out your server to provide you that data using the similar technologies, and by the way, they exist in all their different languages, then now I can get just the data I want, almost as if I were doing a one-to-many type of query, but over HTTP. And it's just much more efficient, um, much easier to work with, and one sec. And so, I could definitely see this being useful, not just in the mobile space with React and such, but like anyone who's doing REST and forced to do a lot of extra calls because of the inflexibility of REST, I could see them jump on GraphQL. Yes, sir. Twitter? REST, as far as I know. Whenever I've done anything with Twitter, it was REST. I thought that was done via REST, but via like JSON payload and a REST call. But I, I, I don't know anymore. It's been a while. It's been like several years, like three or four years, and that's an eternity for an API development. Um, so yeah, so that's GraphQL. Blockchain. <laughs> who, who thinks I should have put blockchain earlier in the, okay. The reason why I didn't, and I understand is that I, I feel like the the hype is trending, but not a lot of implementations are trending. Like real business, there's some, but uh, not enough to impress me to, to call it a trend just yet. No, don't get me wrong. 
I think Bitcoin serves as a real good proof of concept for blockchain overall. Although I don't love, by the way, I don't love Bitcoin much. I feel like Bitcoin is basically like 21st century cryptography wrapped around like medieval monetary policy. But like, but having said that, it is a great proof of concept because I do think blockchain serves as a great possibility for for things like secure online voting. Uh, for um, certain, we're already seeing a bunch of things related to like mobile banking in uh, poor countries, um, high frequency trading, uh, for sure. There's no question about that. And for those who don't know, I, I don't want to jump the gun here. Blockchain, it's, it's a lot to it. But basically, the idea of blockchain is uh, that you have a distributed ledger of transactions that not just once, so instead of having some centralized authority who's in charge, like Bank of America or the post office or whatever, there is is a network, and I'm oversimplifying, there's a network of peer-to-peer -peer computers that basically maintain the entire data set. And each block has a uh, tie via a encryption to the previous block, which means that you can't tamper with anything. Or with, well, you could try, but it'll be detected. And so the bottom line is that via various means like uh, proof of work and, and proof of stake and all these other things, the whole team of computers can come to a consensus as to whether every, all the transactions are good or not. And these transactions don't have to be literally financial, as I mentioned, they could be votes, they could be, um, uh, I actually saw an implementation where they're doing uh, blockchain to help vet refugees. So basically life identity events would be a transaction to help vet refugees, which is really important these days. So don't narrow yourself to financial transaction just because of, of Bitcoin. So given all that, you know, supply chain management, knowing uh, that, okay, this uh, supplier provided this thing and, and my inventory has not gone up and someone over here bought it and now it's been shipped and all, managing all that stuff could be done on blockchain as well. I do see very strong potential for it, uh, but I also think, and I've blogged about this, you know, you know, shameless plug, about there are some things that limit blockchain right now that it needs to solve because um, it, it, the whole one of the central tenets of blockchain, besides the decentralization, is basically a um, what's the word I want to use? A, a, a general unwillingness to trust anything or anyone, and institutions can fail us. And you know, we saw that the financial crisis, right? The SEC and the FDIC and all the rest. You know, we've seen Equifax fail us. And so, given all that, well, we don't trust anybody, and we want to have this nice distributed store. But keep in mind also that we used to have like a complete Wild West kind of situation. And we needed these institutions during the New Deal and such to, to bring some order. So that finding that right balance of centralization, but not, but the good kind and not too onerous and, and working in our interests. I, I feel like blockchain needs to work through a lot of its like, uh, its conflict between its principles and reality. So that's just me. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, please. I think the blockchain has a huge impact on security. It's true. Um, I, I'm worried though. You guys remember SOA? Yeah. You see, you shook your head. Like, ah. The concepts of SOA were sound. It's just that it got ruined by like people selling you heavyweight crap that's just like soured everyone on it. And you, you look at microservices now, they represent like exactly what SOA was trying to go for, but yeah. Yeah, you and your Corbin. Jesus, guy. Yeah. So, uh, um, but my, my worry though is that you have, you don't have quite the, uh, the set of standards and other things you need a technology to have um, to produce something really awesome just yet. And now you start to have companies like IBM and SAP and Oracle, who I consider sort of the celebrity big brother of tech, like the D-list celebrities who used to be awesome, but are trying to be that again. And so like they, they're, I, I'm afraid that they're gonna start selling things that don't pay the freight and are gonna sour people on blockchain, just exactly like what happened with SOA if we don't start to build more of the intellectual and conceptual foundations around blockchain. But, yeah. 
So, yeah, thank you. Uh, augmented reality, you guys know what that is? Everyone focuses on virtual reality, but I think augmented reality is much more interesting. So it's basically like Terminator vision <laughs> or like Google Lens. It's where you superimpose uh, computer graphics on real things to give you information about it. So like, you know, when you watch RoboCop or Terminator, and it's like a CU and it's like, okay, 5'10", 180 pounds, sweating profusely, threat score 120. You know, <laughs> like you start to see like metadata about somebody. Um, you guys remember Google Glass? And how like Google probably be a big thing, but then everyone realized they looked like like douches when they wear it, so it didn't really take off personally. But in the enterprise, uh, a lot of people are using augmented reality Google um, Google Glass to basically be smarter robots. Right? So rather than having their jobs lost to robots, it's like give these human beings who have knowledge uh, some extra ability to like see things a certain way via their glasses, and so it's actually taking off. Pokemon Go did this. Um, and so on. Uh, there's uh, two AR Core and um, AR Net. I think are basically the two big APIs in the iOS and Android world that start writing code in these uh, these aspects. Um, I forgot to mention, by the way, um, with blockchain, uh, I, I would suggest if you want to look at uh, playing around with one, the Ethereum blockchain is really interesting and writing smart contracts with a programming language called Solidity. Uh, Solidity, by the way, which is a statically typed programming language, and uh, just the ideas about that as well. So yeah, so augmented reality, you can write code in with AR Core and AR Kit. And finally, WebAssembly, which gets to the point you made earlier. WebAssembly, so right now the way like our browsers work is that they uh, will compile JavaScript into their bytecode in their virtual machine and then execute that bytecode. Well, what if that bytecode were a standard? Theoretically, then you could write web code in any language you wanted so long as a compiler exists to take that language and turn it into whatever the standard bytecode is. It's similar to what happens in the JVM where you have Java bytecode that runs in the JVM and you have a compiler that takes Java itself and turns it into that. But if you write a compiler for another language, you could do the same. This is how Scala happened. This is how Kotlin happened. This is how Clojure happened. And so, like, you know, those, and same with .NET and those languages. So basically, like, if you have a compiler that can go from whatever, wherever you are to wherever you need to go, you're set, right? Well, WebAssembly is that potential standard. It's a standard bytecode that could run on in any browser. And so, it doesn't mean the end of JavaScript per se, but you could write theoretically in any language, and if a compiler exists. To turn it into WebAssembly bytecode, it now becomes faster to parse and faster to run because there's no intermediate step there you, you need to worry about. Now WebAssembly does interact with, with JavaScript, so you can actually like load JavaScript modules into WebAssembly, or JavaScript can, can load WebAssembly stuff into it. Either so it goes both ways. There are reference implementations using uh, C and C++ right now, and now one with Rust. So there's now a case where Rust is being used to, uh, and I think there's actually a meetup literally tomorrow where they're going to uh, talk about and maybe even bring a laptop and you can start actually writing some Rust and write something together to see how it all works. Uh, I don't know the details, but you can look at that. So the point, though, is that theoretically we could have much faster uh, web development because we don't have to worry about the JavaScript intermediary. We don't need TypeScript and all that stuff anymore if you had just Whatever language you want, and the compiler in between, and WebAssembly is fully flushed out in every browser, it could be pretty cool. So those are the things that I suggest keeping an eye on, and that is it for the evening. I appreciate your time and your attention. Any questions? Comments? Beyond what we already heard? For the WebAssembly one, not this upcoming week, but the week after, there's a the Microsoft Maniac where, uh, I don't think I know, yes, they have a different angle. Um, but Dave Blitz, who when we did the uh, teaching in the JavaScript framework, came and talked about Vue, is doing a talk about using Blazor, which is a framework for writing C sharp, which is using the open source framework.
model framework yeah. to generate web assembly and that's another working web assembly one in the browser is also supporting it. It's, it's interesting to wonder like to what extent is web assembly going to you know what part of the market share is going to be web Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of JavaScript developers are kind of nervous. I don't think there's any reason for that though. So, uh, at least not in the near term. I feel like it's a pretty pervasive language and people really get it and they like it. Um, but it is still a cool thing to consider. And it's also true that I don't know if every language, like, like would they be supported by a compiler? Like, if, I, if I'm, I, so I like Scala a lot. And I read um, a lot of things on Scala about WebAssembly, and they've all said basically, eh, it's not going to happen. We're not going to write a compiler to it. Either in Scala itself, in Scala Native, which is a, another project, and, or Scala JS, all three of them have said, eh. So that could be another barrier if, if a language you really like is somehow just not supported with the compiler for it. <laughs> okay. What is this, the water boy? You can do it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Pardon me? Yes, more contracts. Right, yes, it's code, yeah, written in something called Solidity, which is a programming language from the uh, Ethereum guys. And uh, it's funny because actually um, one of the, the things that I find limiting with blockchain is that there isn't the tooling there. So like if I write, I mean right now when we write software, we're used to being able to unit test it, we're used to being able to deploy it and see what happens. And it, it doesn't really, that doesn't exist right now. Like that whole development pipeline isn't quite there, but theoretically, the language exists. It looks sort of JavaScript ish. It's kind of like a weird combination of JavaScript and like, like Rust, I guess. Like it, where you're controlling memory and things like that, but um, but it looks sort of JavaScript ish. And you write these smart contracts, and uh, they contain all the details of what will happen in terms of like, you know, what's the payment schedule? How much do you owe me? What happens if you're late? Uh, you know, things like that. And again, I'm speaking as financial, but not, transactions absolutely do not have to be technically financial, right? Like we talked about. So, but yeah, so it, Solidity can help you if you're doing an Ethereum smart contract uh, to, yeah, to basically write that contract and define the rules and deploy it in, in, into Ethereum and, and see how it works. Um, but like I said, I feel limited by the tooling, the lack of tooling, and the sort of the immaturity of the software development space around it. But the ideas are cool, and I definitely could see blockchain being really useful for um, for a lot of different. Like I, I'm passionate about like um, secure online voting. I think that'd be a very useful thing. Uh, I think blockchain would be ideal for that if we can get to that point one day. Um, there are so many different things. Healthcare records. There's so many things. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. The potential, one sec. The potential is certainly there. I'm just kind of nervous or I'm waiting, I'm impatient about like what will it take for finally getting the maturity around the standards, the development experience, and like I said, resolving some of their sort of philosophical views with the reality of the world and how it needs to be. You have to have some level of authority. And trying to be completely authorityless and lacking centralization, I mean, you have to find that balance, right? I mean, I get too much authority in, in the wrong hands is also bad. Finding that right balance, it's tricky. Yeah, all the biot, yeah. Exactly. For sure. Okay. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Sir? On the, on the topic of that, and like, I think it's in the intensive stage, which is it waiting is. for the voice. I still get asked. Um, on the contract side, uh, I am just uh, giving it a bit here and there, so then I'll have another response on it. So, this is kind of making the life easy uh, in Thank terms you. of Thank uh, you. writing a smart contract or implementing things that it has the uh, most data plugging to the API. So, to feed off. Uh, doing the complicated stuff and writing contracts and going through the APIs and making things. I think there is a lot of work going on, but oh, I yeah. also, like you mentioned, I think I'm just making the right balance of resolution and everything. Yeah, so I mean, there's Silicon Valley this season is talking about writing a de decentralized internet. Basically, they're talking about like re rethinking blockchain and the Web3 idea, or excuse me, rethinking the internet. And the web three idea of sort of turning the internet into one big blockchain, which if, you know that maybe, but it'll take a while for that to happen. How big is that web? Right. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, and certainly um, if you read my blog post, I get into like those kinds of issues as far as like the, um, you know, you also have like a because um, we try to avoid a class system right in blockchain, but you know when you have the machines who are super souped up and can do the you know the proof of work algorithms. Like they're they're going to dominate, or the blockchains are are, are the um, the users, the validators, in a proof of stake model in Ethereum, who um, already have the collateral, will then risk it in a proof of stake, and then they'll, they'll get more. It'll be a risk get richer scenario. So you start to get like situations where you might have you, you lose the egalitarian nature that's supposed to make blockchain cool. You start to have a class system, which I thought you were supposed to avoid that, right? Well, these are the kinds of things you need to work through. But I mean, don't get me wrong. Super interesting, and they're working on it like crazy because people are really passionate about it. They love it, but it's not there for me to put it as a trend. Yes. Um, I think you're right on blockchain being a lot of hype, primarily because one of the great things about cryptocurrency is that it's decentralized. Yeah. And if you're thinking of blockchain, it's conventional. In that case, you're trying to provide a use case where they can, you know, get that. Yeah. And all of that, like now that we have uh you know infrastructure that's built with the team, that makes it be more possible, but without an incentive to really explore the network. Yeah. Yeah. This current price is not family and they don't have a they don't have a family when they have a well you could have been centralized, right? But you were expecting people to synchronize. But having said that, though, like that, there is also the fact that um, you have full nodes and you have light nodes. So not every node needs everything. Number one. Number two, um, the, the issues with um, higher energy usage and those are more proof of work things, which are related to Bitcoin. And pretty much all the blockchain people know now that if they want to be like viable for other things, proof of work just can't be a thing because you use up so much energy in, in a world that's trying to be more sustainable. It's just not viable. So that's why proof of stake is becoming more important. And they're looking into other consensus mechanisms to figure out like how we can have good consensus without like you know blowing out the entire electricity of the world. Yeah. But that being said, the frequency of not like a super pro Bitcoin, but the frequency of saying Bitcoin is not electricity gets a number. But if you were to you know take all the credit card companies and look at all the electricity they use and find that they are against Bitcoin, I think it's a Bitcoin price. Because you know data centers But they're not operating in the same volumes. So I don't think that's quite a fair comparison. Yeah, yeah. So like. It's like Apple and Orange. Because well, it's more like an apple and an apple grove. 
So, like, I mean, it's just the scale isn't quite the same. So it's hard to compare. But you know, your point's taken. Like, both are so wasteful. Well, they have something else called like the uh, second layer. Yeah. Uh, with yeah. So before we get too much into blockchain talk, any any other comments on anything else? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, five, ten years down the road, what do you think for a percentage of development projects between being uh, augmented reality, uh, voice enabled systems? Um, um, on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, virtual reality? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Virtual reality. I had another one. Yeah, yeah. Like, how, how do you see that? Being Deep learning number one. That's like. I mean, I totally agree with Jensen Wong. Like, this, that's just the thing. Like, forget about it. The others. So, I feel like virtual reality. Like, I, I think it's cool. I watched Next Generation too. I thought the holodeck, or yeah, the holodeck was awesome. But like, I feel like that's ways down the road before it becomes like useful and before the tech is really there to be for people to like it. Um, augmented reality, I think, has a lot of uses. I think we might start to see that in like contact lenses and things like that, um, and certainly phones and, and tablets and things like that. We're already seeing it now with like Google Lens and things like that. That's so hard, huh? I don't. Hmm. I, I would say augmented reality. Thank you all for coming. Um, I would say like augmented reality might be, I don't know if I'd call it 10%. I, it's hard for me to put a number. I, I just feel like when it comes to um, business apps that, that are going to use like graphics, like augmented will certainly be greater than virtual. And it'll probably be like, rather than percentage, I'll probably rather rank them in terms of like performance. So what were the, the choices again? So deep learning number one. Augmented reality. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I would probably put like um, augmented reality above voice. So we have two follow-ups. When you're talking about, there's a chance that 2017, 2018, you look back and you say, "Wow, these were the years where uh, um, Unity and Unreal Engine became application platforms." So and maybe WebGL would that. You know, people like Netscape are saying, yeah, but Zilla is a game engine. The browser. Right? Yeah. There's no distinction between what you do writing a 3D game and what you do writing a web browser. Yeah. Like, is that going to be, are we going to find a new thing that more people doing that type of stuff for their data? I will definitely, uh, I see certainly more so than they are now. Um, and I definitely see the browser as being like, uh, like, the, like, as I mentioned earlier, I don't bet against the web ever. And so, like, Whatever you do right now that's on your native machine, you will be doing in a browser, period. And I think Google's making the same bet with their like Chrome OS and their Pixel Book and that sort of thing. So like I feel like yes, the answer is yes. But basically, whatever you do right now via native APIs will be done via browser APIs, especially as, as WebAssembly and WebGL and other standards become bigger. One more unusable question. Okay. Um, Isn't that like RoboCop, which you're describing? Oh, yeah. Like some sort of dystopian future? <laughs> uh, I think it depends on the nature of who the target you're talking about is. So, like, I could definitely see, like, you ever see, uh, which diehard was it with the kid from, uh, 
where they're in DC and they're driving, the lights all get messed up. It, just, it wasn't the last, I think it was one before that. Yeah, it was the kid from Godfall and yes. Yeah, so look, look at you IMDB. Okay, so, so the thing is, um, I could definitely see that happening to the city. We've already seen our elections infrastructure hacked. Um, I don't mean just like the Facebook and Cambridge Analytica aspect, the social engineering part. I mean like actual states being invaded by nation actors. Um, at least I think 29 was a number, and there, they said there might be more. So like certainly um, uh, that because our state infrastructure is garbage, frankly, and like our city infrastructure. So like I could definitely see one of you know like a movie. Uh, I don't say this to be glib, but like you know a you know, a nuclear plant being hacked, a power grid being hacked. Um, I feel like there are probably a lot of um, nation state actors who have worms or something sitting on machines waiting to be deployed if they feel like we're threatening them or something, or we do something wrong. Um, but uh, so that's certainly true. Now, would I be worried about Amazon being compromised by somebody? Probably less so, far less so. Um, because I don't feel like a lot of the government infrastructure that runs all the things I mentioned, they have the money or the know-how to invest where they need to invest. So, so yeah, that is your cheerful little <laughs> prediction. But yeah, I mean, it's possible, for sure. Yeah. Are you uh, going to kick us out? No, 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 no. Okay. Just, there are no other questions, or are we good? Okay. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Uh, I think so, yeah, there's lots of work to go through. So, now. Awesome getting Kansas speech, man. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, man. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, no, I, um, it was nice to get, to get a little background before you started. Um, but I'd love to learn more about your business.